All right, let's get started with section four of chapter eight. And here is your focus question. By 1800, nearly 400,000 settlers lived west of the Appalachian Mountains, far more than the remaining Indians in the eastern United States. Among the Creek and Cherokee, leaders such as Major Ridge and John Ross encouraged acceptance of the federal civilizing policy. As a result, trading and slaveholding was common among these communities. Other Indian communities expressed revitalization movements, including the Creeks, Cherokees, Shawnees, and Haudenosaunee. Seneca leader Handsome Lake believed that Indians could regain autonomy through pan-Indian unity rather than through military conflict, and he urged his people to avoid vices such as fighting, gambling, drinking, and sexual pr promiscuity. A more militant position was taken by two Shawnee brothers, Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. They refused to sign treaties with whites and advocated resistance to the federal government. Tenskwatawa, a prophet, argued that whites were the source of all evil and that Indians should separate from everything European. In 1810, Tecumseh organized attacks on frontier settlements. However, in Tecumseh's absence, William Henry Harrison's forces destroyed the militant's village at the Battle of Tippecanoe the following year. When Madison asked Congress to declare war on Britain in 1812, the vote reflected a divided nation. Federalists and Republicans representing northern states, where mercantile and financial interests were concentrated, voted against the war. Southern and western representatives voted overwhelmingly for it. Deeply divided, the United States lacked a large navy or army, lacked a central bank since the Bank of the United States Charter expired in 1811, and northern merchants and bankers refused to loan money to the government. Britain, even though focused on the war in Europe, initially repelled American invasions in Canada and imposed an effective blockade on the nation's shipping. In 1814, the British invaded and captured Washington, D.C., burned the White House, and forced the government to flee. The United States had a few victories, including the defense of Baltimore at Fort McHenry, an event that inspired the song that became the national anthem, the Star-Spangled Banner. The United States decisively vanquished Indian forces in the West and South, killing Tecumseh and many other militants. Most notably, forces led by Andrew Jackson forced Indians to cede much of the southeastern lands that became Alabama and Mississippi, and then famously repulsed British forces at the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. This battle was fought before news reached America that American and British negotiators had signed the Treaty of Ghent, which had ended the war the previous month. The treaty changed nothing, giving the United States no territory or rights regarding U.S. ships or impressment. The treaty produced an unusual episode in American diplomacy concerning the fate of thousands of enslaved people who, like during the War of Independence, fled to British lines to find freedom. Though the treaty specified the return of those enslaved people after the war, Britain refused, and after lengthy, inconclusive negotiations, both Britain and the United States agreed to international arbitration by one of the world's leading despots, Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. Nicholas ruled in favor of the United States, and Britain paid compensation, while most of the free slaves settled in Nova Scotia, Canada. At the time, some Americans called the War of 1812 the Second War of Independence. The war affirmed the ability of the Republic to defend itself and wage war without sacrificing its Republican institutions. It made Andrew Jackson a national hero, and it sealed the doom of Indians who occupied lands east of the Mississippi River, thus finally securing this vast area for whites, many of whom in the South would bring enslaved people and slavery with them. The war strengthened Americans' nationalism and their sense of isolation and separation from Europe. The War of 1812 profoundly affected the border between the United States and Canada as a dividing line where much of the fighting took place. A large trade had developed between Vermont and Quebec where much of the smuggling during Jefferson's embargo had taken place. During the war, many Canadians became suspicious of American traders as spies and American attacks added to anti-Americanism. Many had family and interests on both sides of the border and exchange continued after the war, but more Americans directed their gaze westward. The war reaffirmed both American and Canadian national identities, and both viewed the conflict as a struggle for freedom from the other. On the other side of the Atlantic, Britain's defeat of Napoleon inaugurated a long period of peace in Europe. Diplomatic affairs faded from its previously prominent role in American public life, leading to an increased sense of separation from Europe, while Canada also experienced an increased sense of nationalism, partly based on separateness from the United States. Americans were puzzled why Canadians did not welcome American forces as bringers of liberty, and each side developed enduring stereotypes of the other. 
Americans viewed Canadians as monarchical, European, and lacking in understanding of liberty, while Canadians viewed Americans as unusually prone to violence. The war sealed the demise of the Federalist Party, which had been briefly revitalized by widespread opposition to the war in the North. Madison only narrowly won re-election as president in 1812. But an ill-timed convention of New England Federalists at Hartford, Connecticut in December of 1814 badly injured the party. Convention delegates criticized the domination of the presidency by Virginians, lamented the diminishing influence of the Northeast as new Southern and Western states joined the Union, and called for an end to the Three-Fifths Clause. They demanded two-thirds vote in Congress for declaring war, admitting new states, and laws restricting trade. Contrary to later myth, the Hartford Convention did not call for secession or disunion, but it affirmed the right of a state to interpose its authority if the federal government violated the Constitution. Ultimately, Jackson's electrifying victory at New Orleans made the Federalists seem unpatriotic. Within a few years, the Federalist Party disappeared. The urban and commercial interests the party represented were small in an expanding agrarian nation, and their elitism and distrust of democracy was increasingly out of touch with an increasingly democratic culture. But the Federalists had raised an issue that would not go away in the future, the domination of the national government by the slaveholding South, and the kind of commercial development they championed would soon inaugurate a social and economic transformation of the nation. So that's the end of section four and the end of this chapter, and we'll see you next time.